Our dissension into the abyss is halted by the voice of a woman, as her recollection brings forth the imagery of a star-shaped compass. As that compass is spinning, she calls to someone, Irumiwi, addressing them in a manner a person would when standing above a grave. This Irumiwi, indeed, they seem to be gone, but like anyone who has lost someone, the girl addresses Irumiwi fondly and reminisces on the years prior. Past recollections describe how the girl was seeking a place where the relic in her possession would level itself, a slight motion that is meant to telegraph a journey's end. Although the nature of the compass and its destination in all reality was just hearsay from what she explains, the girl doesn't truly know if the tilted compass is navigating towards anything real. She only knows what was relayed about its origin from a man who was once her guardian. Further flashbacks of the man aforementioned beset the girl. He wronged her in more ways than one. She then goes on to confess about the events of her abuse, reminding us that this story remains dark, but is mature enough to have her trauma included. After all, she isn't recounting this memory for us to hear. It's the type of pain that would only be shared to a confidant. In this case, being the person that she's explaining this to, Irumiwi. There was a recurring story synonymous with her torture. It frequented the mouth of her boastful guardian during her darkest moments. The story always started in the same way. With smoke. Smoke emitting from a smoldering ship at sea. In his former ventures, the guardian had boarded the wreckage and found that the ship's inhabitants were all malformed in some fashion. All but one, that is. The surviving man was visibly traumatized about the affair, huddled away from everything. He remained immobile until the guardian grabs hold of something, a familiar compass that was resting nearby. Noticing that action, it incites the crouching man to reanimate and he forewarns about the direction of the compass, afterwards exclaiming about a giant pit that swallowed a city made of gold underneath the expanse. The tale ends there, but it always ends in the same way that it begins, with smoke. But this time, it was smoke pluming off the skin of a child. The story went on to define the man for the entirety of his life. He was nothing more than a lofty highlight reel in the end because all that he accomplished was swanking about the tale. He rewound it constantly for others to hear, but never acted on the incentive to see if the rumor had validity. The girl, on the other hand, did have the conviction to see this tale through. And so, she chose to believe in the Golden City wholeheartedly. She longed to forgo her existence to a life where she could disappear, renouncing her past fully and beginning anew. Yet, even after the Guardian's involvement in her life ceases, she still hears his voice haunting her memory. It's a voice that shames, berates, and anguishes her life at every moment. His words left a lasting effect on her person, but it wasn't just an echo wailing at her anymore. The memories of him were eventually converted as encouragement to supersede her misfortune. She trained relentlessly for her dream, and her hard work accumulated to where she is now. The tireless girl was seated to finally pause, reflecting on those set of events after reaching a benchmark in her life. She made it this far, and that's an achievement best acknowledged with a friend. However, her talk with Idumiwi ends abruptly as she suddenly bolts, racing towards the top of a deck. Apparently, she has been on a sea voyage of her own since, although she didn't seem to be accompanied by the likes of her former caretaker this time. Beside her was an entirely new cast of allies that have set sail in support of her, most notably Wazukyan and Balaf. They have all journeyed in search of the Golden City, and while her social setting has drastically improved, life is not yet without obstacles, because the trials of the sea issue against her dreams. Her objective is forward, but the side of it wanes. Is it worth progressing 
when what she is looking for is not clearly there in sight. Her hopes arise, and they fall again with the waves. The only thing consistent in her life during this time is her ever-present nausea. The girl is at her wit's end due to seasickness. Wazukian, in contrast, remains positive overall in the face of every adversity, as any good captain would to upkeep a steady morale within the fleet. Expanding on her fatigue, it is revealed that the girl reserves doubt about her role as guidepost, even this deep into the journey. Wazukian doesn't dispute her title, since he's the one who assigned her that position in the first place. She was deemed qualified in her duty and is an integral part of the Ganja's mission. Yet she is timid, naturally so since her self-worth was decimated by her former guardian. Escaping from the abuse, passing boot camp, and making friends. In spite of all the achievements, the accomplishments themselves were never successful in splitting the memories from her. They regularly hamper away at her spirit and thus have molded her nature as a person. Wazukian instills confidence in the places where she is lacking through nebulous trust. It may seem difficult for her to have faith in his pitch at first, but unlike everyone aboard, he doesn't react to problems in the same way that others have because he believes in the process, accepting the fact that adversity is part of that same undertaking. Indeed, he'll do whatever it takes to get to where they need to be, whether that be scavenging for vermin in order to survive, or by giving reassurance about a cause where confidence is staggering. There were challenges, and there will continue to be challenges along the way, but Wazukian is never discouraged by any of it. He is resolute, and the girl recognizes that about him at least. That statement is reinforced by the entry speech of Balaf. People deemed Wazukian as a lunatic, and they dismissed his abstract ramblings until he began producing results right in front of them. The girl, she herself, is an example about one of the many things that he had foretold. Their meeting wasn't coincidental. It wasn't like bumping into a stranger at a social event. It was an encounter already scheduled by fate. And somehow, Wazukian knew that it would occur beforehand. He is someone who must have spent his entire life convincing others about himself until they had no choice but to recognize his clairvoyance. At this point in the journey, the tale of the Golden City still remains hearsay. Fantasy may indeed be all it amounts to, but even then, Wazukian will manifest their dreams, his dream, into existence. Whether it be by destiny or by his own hand in the matter, if they happen to arrive at an empty landscape in the end, he will construct the city golden brick by golden brick himself if that's what it necessitates. Not fully convinced in herself yet, the girl views Wazukian's gift as something useful. He has worth as a leader, while she feels that she is unable to contribute enough, going as far as to say that she wouldn't fetch her much of anything if she were to be sold. She specifically mentions her body to support that claim. Her caretaker not only burdened her with emotional scars, but lasting physical ones to pair as well. It's saddening to know that she relegates her very being as a commodity to barter off, mostly because that's what her life was before meeting these friendly crewmates. Their kindness sharply contradicts the conditioning that was forcibly implanted by her guardian. Pain is all that she knew before. Reprogramming her with comfort is not only foreign to her, but difficult for her to accept as well. Yet, the crew tries nonetheless, because they value her existence, even when she doesn't. While Wazukian gave her reassurance, Balaf took it a step further and imparted an affirmation through his philosophy. According to him, a person could be well adorned with pleasing attributes, but that in itself does not comprise the true nature of one's beauty. The girl loads everything about herself, but Balaf's perception discounted her flaws only to recognize the tenacious will encased within her eyes. That distinction, to him, is beautiful. Determination 
where the opportunity to yield is plentiful. Balaf caps off his regard with a compliment, dispelling her query by saying that she is more capable than what she realizes. She looks down in response to his admiration, perhaps having already heard similar accolades from separate accounts. The difference in this instance is that she admires Balaf. More specifically, she admires his confidence, and so his words have that much more impact to them. Keep in mind that his body appears to be disfigured as well, yet he exudes positivity in this matter. Instead of dismissing all praise like before, she was beginning to reflect on what was actually said and taking it to heart for a change because Balaf leads by example. Their talk is interrupted by a fellow crewmate who bursts from the cabin below and calls to the girl regarding a sudden emergency. This moment is significant because it is at this point that we finally learn the name of this character, Fuego. Time elapses, and we next see the Ganja ship swerving against a blast of currents. To make matters worse, cargo passes them by, indicating that their fleet has been reduced in the chaos. Their concern suddenly shifted when Vuiko unexpectedly noticed that the compass was poised vertically. Following that revelation, another crew member identifies an island in the distance. It had appeared that their destination was close in sight at long last. Shortly thereafter, the surviving crew members dock the last remaining ship onto the shore of the island. They promptly begin unpacking their supplies physically, while simultaneously unpacking their emotions internally about the event. How eager everyone must have felt to know that their dream was but a step closer. We previously uncovered the anguish Fuego had undergone, yet she had not been uniquely afflicted amongst the Ganja. Establishing a new life meant just as much to everyone as it did to Fuego, due in part to the fact that they lived through hardships of their own. Pain is what brought them together, and pain is the same commonality that motivates everyone to hoist themselves for the summit and through hard work, they eventually stand nearing the slump of the crater, the giant pit. It existed. Staring at it meant that the golden city was just underneath the fall of its yawning. Feeling more empowered than ever before, they press on post-haste, but are soon ambushed by the indigenous folk of the island. The Ganja were identified as outsiders, but upon the tribesmen confronting them, they failed to detect any impression of animosity towards their people. Both parties compromised in due course, and the Ganja were directed to the native village where they were allowed reprieve before descending into the pit below. Not knowing that people had settled on the island to begin with, the Ganja concluded that they are out of their depth in terms of knowledge. If this journey is to be successful, it would be prudent for them to be prepared in the case of anything occurring. Thus, they inquired about restricted information by questioning a village elder, who was apprehensive to disclose their secrets. He remained stubborn until he had spotted the compass knotted around Vuego's neck. In this village, desire is not fulfilled without exchanging for something in return. Understanding this, Balaf consults with Fuego to offer up the compass, expecting pushback on the proposal. Balaf instead sees Fuego hand over the relic without stalling on the matter. For a long time, the star-shaped compass represented the only direction Fuego had in life. It promised a city made of gold at the end of its lead but it had also given her a sense of purpose. Relinquishing it from her meant that she had decided to follow her own path rather than have her dreams reliant on the guidance of a relic. During that interaction, a village girl is seen spying over Fuego in the background. That same girl appears behind Fuego just as the Ganja are about to begin their dive into the abyss. Perplexed by her attendance, Balaf examines the girl and uncovers the display of tattoos that explain this occurrence. Upon translating the words, 
it is revealed that she is unable to bear children. Therefore, she has been exiled away from the village. Her state of infertility calls into question how they knew about such a thing at all. The girl shares similar pain relative to the ganja. She would seemingly fit right in given that she was ousted by her very own relatives. The issue is that she would expend vital resources where supply of that is already scarce. And so, they vote against her inclusion. Voiko, taking pity in the moment, advocates for the girl to remain. In a prior flashback, we learn that Voiko endeared herself to a kitten and had adopted the feline into her care. Not only was she affectionate to this creature that was more vulnerable than her, but perhaps she understood how alone it was and offered it shelter because she felt the same. This time was no different from the compassion that she exhibited for her cat. Fuego posits that they are in need of a guide, a person who is familiar with the dangers surrounding the pit. Thinking only about the journey ahead, Wazukyon ultimately makes the final call and assigns her to that position, much to Fuego's relief. A montage ensues following the many circumstances encountered under each preceding layer. As it turns out, they were delvers at heart, and they too relished in the excursion. Their thrill for exploration was well satiated until the ganja stood before the entrance of the Edo front vessel. Fuego paused, only briefly, knowing that this was the preliminary stage propped above the Golden City. Gathering again her musing, it spurs her for the yoke-like barrier. A motion that transitions the segment back to the present day, where Rico, Reg, Nanashi, and Menya similarly burst forth into the vessel. Within said vessel, their observations denote the walls being transparent rather than opaque, like it had appeared on the outside, granting them sight around the revolving water. The group also remarks about the noise, or lack thereof. Despite the Edo front elevator being positioned at the Whirlpool center point, each individual is observant about the details of their surroundings, going as far as to describe the aroma from within. Eternal fortune, incest permeated the room, and it had likely been lit on a command impelled by Bonedrude. The flower the smell derives from is a symbol of good luck, among other things. This gesture may imply that the Sovereign himself anticipated that they would arrive at this point beforehand. In retrospect, he never outright denied them access to the elevator. Nanachi advocated against violence because she knew what Bondrude was capable of doing. Rico and Reg only obliged out of respect for Nanachi's wary, despite having knowledge of the inhumane experimentations he conducted. Not being able to resist his scientific oddities provoked an escalation of conflict where there didn't need to be when granting them passage. He got carried away, and his actions left a lasting impression on the team, especially when considering that he is ever-present on their travels, running unsolicited surveillance by way of Nanachi's vision somehow. Nanachi isn't thrilled about having her privacy violated, but she isn't bothered further by the thought, because his hands are now seemingly out of reach. Moreover, she simply isn't going to let that detail taint her future adventure with her friends. Nanachi is developing into a person who can better come to terms with misgivings and let things go, mostly because she doesn't feel alone anymore. Here, she has two friends that have literally stood up against her worst individual fear, that being Bonedrude. And for the first time in a long time, she feels safe with them at her side. Her outlook is optimistic as a result, and the whole team embraces that feeling. Reg takes the moment past embrace and begins to sniff Nanachi, alluding to his newly found keen sense of smell. Although the interaction is interrupted by a turbulent shift felt along the floor.
onward to the sixth layer. They dive where colossal fish casually pass them by, and crowds of ancient fossils bombard the vessel along the way. Miscellaneous things transpire during their transit until their boredom is quelled by a surge of incandescent light spreading below their vantage. The boundary past the sea of corpses is upon them as timelines converge once more. Olden hymns ceremony their arrival just as the sphere settles kindly atop of the holding grounds. The golden city of promise, grand and unveiled by flares of brilliance. This is the site where dreams coalesce, a moment of celebration for each delver who made it before the stature of the golden city, having knowledge of the consequences and the things they will and have endured up until this point should have already cleaved away at their optimism many layers ago. Yet they still managed to tease out joy out of themselves, given their circumstance. The abyss, for all its savagery into consideration, failed to dissuade the individuals present from exploring beneath. To the contrary, this is exactly where they've longed to be. So, when they express genuine moments of happiness, where happiness is rarely felt, I can't help but to celebrate alongside their success. That sentiment is the primary notion that I'll carry as I continue on with the story of Made in Abyss.